You have to. Hi guys! Thanks for your patience, everybody. We are live at 7.03 tonight. I appreciate everybody sticking around. And we are just wrapping up our competition style ribs. We'll be cutting into those momentarily. Ah, maybe not momentarily. Half an hour from now, 40 minutes from now. So we'll set those aside. Because we are doing the whole rib program. Start to finish, introduction to advanced. And I'm gonna try to talk quickly. I'm gonna try to get through this. We have a lot of material to cover. So I'm gonna get right into it. We're doing two different styles of rib tonight. We're doing a competition style rib. Um, not my full program. There's no major secrets being released out here. But if any of you are unfamiliar with competition style ribs, uh, you'll pick up a few tips tonight. And these ribs are delicious. They're sweet, they're succulent, they're tender, they're really moist. These are the ribs we turn into judges when it really counts. These are the ribs I do not enjoy the most at home. So we're doing our second style of ribs tonight. That's a hot and fast, straight up, no wrap, no sauce, uh, rib cooked on the Gateway Drum Smoker. And we'll talk about both of these from start to finish tonight. So if any of you are advanced cooks or competition cooks, feel free to stick around, but I can't promise you're, you're gonna learn a ton tonight. We're gonna keep this fairly introductory. Uh, right from the beginning, which is a raw rack of ribs. Now I planned on talking about the difference between side ribs and back ribs tonight. In fact, I even bought some back ribs at my local grocery store for $22 a rack. <laughs> and those are currently sitting in my wife's minivan, so we can't demonstrate them for you tonight. But we're cooking side ribs, so that's what I have in front of you here. Let me talk quickly about the difference. Back ribs are generally a little bit leaner and a little more tender. Back ribs are more popular in Canada, in the United States. You're generally going to pay more for back ribs compared to side ribs. They're more popular. Supply and demand, right? Everything that turns people off about side ribs get me excited. More fat, more connective tissue, they're tougher. You can throw these side ribs on your gas grill for a half an hour with indirect heat. They're going to be cooked, but they're still going to be chewy. They're still going to be kind of greasy. But over the course of four to six hours, going low and slow on a smoker, we're going to turn those tough, greasy ribs into something truly magical. In the competition world, we're finding that, you know, upwards of 70 or 80% of cooks turn in side ribs. Um, everything that turns people off about side ribs adds to those side ribs. Once you learn how to cook real barbecue, that connective tissue, that fat marbling that's in there, all of that breaks down. And that means those side ribs are going to have a little extra flavor in the end, a little extra moisture. That being said, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, tell everybody that, you know, if they're trying to pick side ribs or back ribs, you cook what you like, cook what your family likes, right? Ribs are delicious either way. Uh, a good friend of mine managed to snag first place in ribs at the World Barbecue Championships, turning in back ribs. So who am I to argue? Just because side ribs are my favorite doesn't mean they're the best solution for everybody. So we'll get in here right away. Um, what I'm looking for in ribs is a number of things. I'm gonna get Delaney to come zoom in, zoom in here shortly. But these are some nice big slabs on the table here. Uh, these are the biggest racks I can buy in Canada, 44 to 46 ounce Canadian pork. Uh, if I'm cooking ribs, I wanna cook the biggest rack I can find. I don't want those thin little lightweight ribs. I want a thick rack, a little more fat, all that uh, heft to it, all that volume is gonna mean there's higher chance of producing ribs that have some moisture in the end. And here's what I'm looking for. Number one, I'm gonna point out this rack here. I'm looking at that fat marbling through there, right? All those white streaks. That means that fat marbling is gonna keep that meat nice and moist. Compare that to another section of rib here. This is a little leaner. You don't see as much of that white fat in there. So, okay. Okay, moving along to trim these up. First of all, I'm gonna talk about um, what I would do for a competition style trim. So I'll set these two aside. We don't need to trim all three tonight, but this is the nicest out of the bunch. The other thing I'm looking for, if it's an actual competition style rack, so I'll focus on those bones on the underside of the rib. You know, if I can see those bones in the retail package, that's ideal. Uh, usually I end up buying more ribs than I need just so I can go through them and look at those bones. What I want is those bones to be relatively straight. So here's an example. You're looking for those bones to be fairly parallel. That means when I slice these ribs up, those cuts are gonna be nice and parallel. Those ribs will look good in the box. I don't have any real crooked bones on here, but oftentimes you'll find 
halfway through their brack, those bones start to twist off in a different direction or the bones curve. Um, they taste the same, but for presentation, I'm gonna shoot for those straight bones every time. Okay, when it comes time to prepare this rack, once again, we're focused on the competition style rib right now. Really important in this world to dig in here and pull this membrane off. This membrane does sometimes act as a barrier. Makes it a little harder for the spice flavor to penetrate into the meat, smoke flavor to penetrate into the meat. Just grip it with a paper towel. It's relatively easy to remove. We'll pull that membrane right off. Okay, if you need to get in there with the knife, do a little extra touch up, feel free to do that. I see it, thank you. And I'm just gonna square this rack up a little bit here. I know this end here, this thin little end here is just gonna turn into rib jerky. That might be okay at home, but in a competition style setting, I know it's not gonna be of any value to us, so we'll just trim it right off. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. We'll flip it over again, look at the top side of the rack. I don't see any major chunks of fat, anything in here. That's ready to cook. Okay, so I'm only gonna trim the one rack right now. We'll get this thing ready for the cooker. Obviously, in the competition style setting, flavor is a really important component. So you have a number of ways you can get flavor in here. You could blind this whole rack. Sorry, brine this whole rack. I have some friends that do that successfully. It's not part of my program. Um, if you want to get real serious, you could inject a little solution in between the bones here. Or you could just get in here with some spice rub. Get that spice rub to it here nice right off the bat. Uh, if any of you are familiar with yellow mustard as a binder, that's always an option. I really only turn to that if I find my meat, my, my meat is on the dry side. Today it's not on the dry side. Got some moisture on the surface there. I tend to save those binders for the bigger cuts like brisket and pork butt, where we want a ton of spice rub adhering to the meat. In the case of ribs, you know, I'm not going to go with a heavy, heavy coat here. I do want to be able to taste the pork in the end, so I find that binder isn't really necessary. So I'm just gonna get in right here. We have got the tumbleweed all-purpose rub. Is that rock centered there? Yeah. Nice even application of spice rub, guys. I'm letting it rain down from 12 inches above. No need to physically rub it into the meat, but I do wanna press it down, make sure it sticks nicely. Okay, nice even coat of that spice rub. I've seen a lot of people, you know, in my classes, they ask me when we should be applying this spice rub and i'd like to tell you that doing it 24 or 48 hours in advance is a huge advantage i honestly don't feel that's the case i think by getting this spice rub on here 15 or 20 minutes before the ribs hit the smoker that's enough time for the reaction to occur that we're looking for now i'll set these ribs off to the side we're going to come back to that rack but the reaction i'm looking for is some moisture on the surface of this meat most spice rubs are going to contain some salt and that salt will draw some moisture up out of that meat. Once that happens, you'll find that the sugar in the rub will dissolve, the salt in the rub will dissolve, and it'll get shiny on the surface. We want that moisture on the surface when these ribs go to the smoker because that moisture will attract smoke particles. That moist surface on the rib will also enhance the development of what's called a smoke ring. The smoke ring, of course, does not taste like anything, but it does look damn cool. So we're after that smoke ring every time. Even in competition barbecue where the judges are specifically told they cannot judge appearance based on that smoke ring, we're still going to try to make sure that smoke ring develops. I haven't introduced my helper tonight, my daughter Delaney. She may step in here to wrap ribs in a little while, but she is watching for questions, guys. So if any of you have questions about the cooking process here tonight, feel free to type them in. And once we get through our demonstration here, We'll field those questions. Feel free to move that back again. So you can see your pretty face. That Q&A session is the highlight of these Wednesday Night Live clinics. I've been teaching ribs for about 10 years, literally thousands of students, and I cannot guarantee I'm gonna cover every important point every time. So we love those questions. Chances are really good I'm gonna miss something important. I'll answer them in a little bit. You so can stand back, up straight. I can stand up straight, okay. wonderful. So, a little bit of uh, further information on the ribs. Um, we're looking, I like the nice thick ribs. Um, I'm looking for nice pink marbling, uh, nice pink meat with white marbling running through that meat. I prefer side ribs. I do not judge anybody that prefers 
prefers back ribs. Um, I practiced back ribs back in 2016. I cooked about 25 times, two racks at a time, practicing for an event called Memphis in May. We were invited down to represent Canada that year. And at that event, it is traditional that teams turn in back ribs. So I had a lot of practicing to do back then. I got pretty good at it. Uh, our scores were very high. And I still prefer side ribs. <laughs> a little more moisture, a little more tenderness in the end, a little more flavor. So um, let's talk a little bit about cooking here. Uh, 250 degrees Fahrenheit is my go-to temperature for ribs. Uh, most of the time, um, anybody who's really familiar with my, my cook uh, knows I've, I've converted to a hot and fast cook for competition in the last couple of years. But traditionally, I'm at 250 degrees for ribs. Uh, even in our catering business and food truck and so on, 250 is our magic number. So a nice thick rack of ribs like this. We're going to be looking at five to six hours in total cook time. During that period, we want to make sure there's enough time for all that connective tissue to break down, right? These ribs need to get tender and that does take time. Being a competition style rack right now, part of that cooking process involves aluminum foil. That foil is necessary for a few different reasons. Okay, Sunspun Wide Heavy Duty, the best brand I've ever come across in Canada. That foil is necessary to help braise the meat, right? And we're adding some other flavors in that foil to help add flavor to the meat, sweet flavors, savory flavors. But that braising process really helps tenderize the meat and allows it to kind of get really tender without losing a lot of its moisture. So it traps the moisture inside that foil package too. So again, roughly three hours on the smoker, 250 degrees. We're gonna pull some ribs off here right away and show you what we're looking for in regards to wrapping. We wrap based on the color of the wrap, not internal temperature. And we wrap for three reasons. Number one, we want to preserve the beautiful color that develops on those ribs, that bark color. Appearance is really important in the world of competition barbecue. It's not the most important factor, but it's up there. So we're going to trap in that, that beautiful dark red cherry color. Uh, secondly, again, it allows us to add liquid or uh, spices or ingredients to that foil to add some flavor to the meat. And thirdly, it does help accelerate the cooking process. So the less time that meat spends on the smoker, the less time it has to release moisture and steam and so on. So that foil is a part of cooking for competition. We do have a rack. We're gonna wrap that up here shortly, but let me get you through the rest of the process here. Uh, 250 degrees, again, I'm wrapping after about three hours, three and a half hours. Um, for those of you cooking on pellet grills, um, a, lot of, a lot of people talk about challenges with pellet grills in regards to smoke flavor. And a lot of people get around that by cooking at a lower temperature to start. You know, a lot of smokers have a, you know, a smoke mode or an extra smoke mode. They'll run it in that lower temperature smoke mode for a little while, an hour, maybe an hour and a half, before they kick the temperature up. Uh, if you're cooking competition style ribs, obviously you're going to need to do a little practice. And that just comes down to knowing your pit. So, Everybody's gonna have their own specific time and temperature schedule. Um, but once we're ready to wrap, we're gonna pull these racks in, we're gonna wrap them up, we're gonna add some ingredients to that foil. And then we are going to put those ribs back on the smoker. We're gonna let them run for another hour, hour and a half at 250. At that point, they should be pretty close to their final tenderness. We'll pull those ribs off. We'll talk a little bit tonight about how we evaluate texture and tenderness for competition. And finally, we'll apply a glaze, a sauce at the end, throw those ribs back on the pit, allow that cook glaze to set up nicely, and they're ready to carve. We'll talk about slicing ridges, slicing ribs and bones for presentation. We're gonna do all of that shortly here. So um, I think I'm gonna pull that rack off the smoker right now. Delaney is free to open the garage door. And we can talk about wrapping these ribs up. Okay, bring the light over. I'll, I'll grab the light if you grab. Here you go. Oh, I'm taking them off. I don't know what you meant. Well, I just meant wrap them. Yeah, you can wrap them. Okay. Let's bring the camera over. Woo! Nice back. Whoa. All right. So these are the ribs we're wrapping right now. So sexy. Put on these on the trusty odor. She's been running it. Ah, we kicked the temperature up a little while ago. It's running at about 275 right now, so. 
Whoa. Okay, sorry. Okay. There y'all go. Okay. Can you... Now you want to step in here and do it? Yeah. All right. Let me talk about ingredients first, and then you can take your pick. Oh, thick. All right. So wrapping this meat up, I'm going to do a close-up of, of the color of that meat here shortly. But three components are going in this foil. Number one, fat. Good old squeeze parquet if you're not familiar with that. Or if you are familiar with that. Anybody who's not familiar with squeeze parquet, as soon as that border opens up, it's a buck sixty-nine a bottle at Walmart in Minot or wherever your closest border town is. I also like butter. Okay, either one of those is a good option. That's your fat component. Secondly, your sugar component. We have brown sugar is a common ingredient. Maple syrup I do enjoy. And finally, a liquid ingredient. A um, couple of options here. I like smoke on wheels pork marinade. It's got a bit of a soy and pineapple tropical component to it. Uh, another one here I've used in the past, Sweet Smoke Q out of Florida. That's their pork Q juice. Can you use Five Alive? Five Alive? Good question. I don't like citrus on ribs. But if that's what you like, go for it. Okay, I'm doing it. Oh my god, we're doing Five Alive. Okay, another thing that I've kind of tackled on to here. Cherry bubbly. Okay, not a real strong cherry flavor. But uh, it's subtle, right? And it, it does add a little bit of that liquid. Other options here, you know, any commercial pork injection, pork marinade mix. This one is Blue Hog, it's a good one. I'll just get in there and sprinkle a little bit right on the meat. A little extra pork flavor, simply can't hurt, right? Okay, I promised I'd get out of the way and let the weenie wrap up these ribs, so that's what I'm gonna do. Talk. Well, you have to tell them what you're doing. Okay. Okay, introducing Delaney Reinhardt. Love she loves wrapping ribs more than any kid, any adult I've ever met. <laughs> so thanks, Delaney. You're welcome. <laughs> My voice cracked. Okay, you're hitting puberty. Fine. I know. Puberty sucks. Yeah. So what are you going to put in these ribs tonight, Delaney? Okay, I'm going to use squeeze butter because it farts and it's really funny. Okay, okay, I promised I'd show you the color of these ribs here. Okay, it's a little dark in here tonight, guys. It's probably showing up darker on camera than it needs to. Okay, Delaney has chosen the good old squeeze parquet. Me? Yeah. We're going to wrap these up the... meat side down. Well then, whatever. Okay. So we failed our mission, but it's fine. You're fine. Alright, so ingredient number one. Squeeze parquet. Woo, so sexy. Now this is an optional ingredient, guys, and keep going. Okay. I've, uh, I've done the side-by-side -side comparison. Again, I have friends in the competition world who do okay. quite well without that fat component. But I like a little margarine or butter in there, so. Okay, I'm using brown sugar as my, like, sugar component. Okay. Okay. So what, she's also adding some to the meat itself and some to the foil, right? We want a layer of ingredients on both sides right. of the meat. Okay. All right, so sugar, fat, See, and liquid. I have an issue. What's the issue? Well, you usually do maple syrup. Yeah. Right? And apple juice. Yes. But maple syrup and Five Alive don't work. Okay. So. So, chuck the Five Alive. No, keep the Five Alive. <laughs> Let's, can we do both? Yes. Okay. This is how we learn, guys. Are we eating these for supper? You are. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to end with that. Okay, I'm keeping maple syrup. That's All right. So, offer. we're going back to the maple syrup. Okay, that's good. So yeah, there's a lot of sweetness going in here, guys. But remember, these are competition ribs, and can you wrap them? Although we love judges, uh, sweet this sweet profile does seem to do well with the judges. Okay, there you go. Okay, looking good. Yeah, I'll wrap them up. Come on out. Okay. Bye, friends. That was awesome. So the meat will pick up some of this sweetness, but honestly, most of that liquid's still going to be in the foil at the end of the cooking process. What we're looking for is the flavors here, right? This sugar is not all gonna soak into the pork. Okay, back to the ribs. 
really important that we don't puncture this foil. So I'm going to very carefully fold these up. Okay, I don't want to get too aggressive with that foil, but I do want to make sure it's wrapped tightly. And this is your extra bonus tip for the night. Yeehaw. A second sheet of foil <laughs> does help to make sure we don't rip through that foil. I don't get picked up at all. I'll pick it up anyway. I need okay. garbage. All right, nice tight little package. Those are ready to go back on the smoker. So, if I can trouble you to run outside and do that, you I would Hubert? be most grateful. Then we can eat them in an hour and a half. Yeah. All right, let's ditch this brown sugar. Dip the final line. So back to our gateway cooking process. Uh, gateway. Let's turn her up to 275. You said gateway and point it to the yoder. Yeah, okay, yoder. We'll shoot for 275 tonight. I do want these ribs to get tender so we can have supper tonight. Okay, so back to the cooking process. 250 on pellet grill. We're looking at roughly three to three and a half hours before we wrap them. We wrap based on color, right? That bark has to be set. That color is, we're looking for that nice dark cherry red. Uh, that color gets preserved once we wrap those ribs up in foil. So once I pull the ribs out of the foil here, you'll see what the color looks like. Uh, the ribs that we're ready to carve and glaze and hopefully eat tonight here. So, um, quickly I'll show you what this raw rack of ribs looks like. Okay, we're starting to see the moisture come up out of this meat. Starting to get a little shine on the surface there. Okay, hopefully that shows up okay. That's just our indication that the salt is doing its work. So we want that salt drawing some moisture up out of that meat. That moisture on the surface of the meat will help that smoke adhere and help the smoke ring develop and so on. Okay, let's just pick these up, roll them out. Cook those another day. So when you get a moment, transfer those please. To what? Anywhere but here. Okay. There's room over there beside the fridge. All right, little impromptu hand sanitizing from touching raw pork and we're ready to move on to the cooked ribs here so pull out another cutting board looking forward to the questions guys because i'm sure i'm missing something let me talk quickly about rob's ribs okay now we're going to carve those up as well i have a raw rack i'm going to pull out here and, and demonstrate um where did my raw ribs go? <laughs> I know. They're right here. Ah, ah. Alright. So when it comes to Rob's ribs, we're starting with the same ribs. Okay. Nice big St. Louis style slab here. There's an extra chunk of fat on the end. That's going to be delicious in two hours. That stays. Membrane stays. I mean, if I really wanted to get picky about it, I'd probably carve off this flap of meat on the end, right? That flap of meat there that you see is it's gonna end up really dry and chewy. Maybe we'll save it, maybe we'll throw it in a soup or something later in the week, so. Spice rub there, again, we're gonna hit it with the tumbleweed. And this is a really straightforward cook, you guys. The cook is gonna be a hot and fast cook on our gateway drum smoker. A method affectionately known as burn and turn. In other words, we're cooking hot, 300 to 325. Uh, we're going to flip those ribs over every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, get a good bark, get a good color developed on both sides of the rack. Then we're going to take them off and rest them for 10 minutes and then we're going to eat them. In two hours, we're going to have a rack of ribs that's tender, loaded with smoke flavor, and uh, should be nice and delicious. No fancy wrapping procedures, no crazy competition sauce, just good tasting ribs. So now we'll put those raw racks in there. I'm going to trouble Delaney one more time to open up the garage door so we can take a pick, peek at Rob's ribs. Rob's ribs. Thank you. Rob's ribs. I like that. That has a cool ring to it. Rob's ribs? Rob's ribs. I'm glad you like it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, 
Hey friends, we're going on another adventure. Woohoo! Okay. What? Okay. There you go. Coming out. Just a little cold weather. You'll be okay. No, the cold weather which right. is going to so eat the drum's me. running at 300 Fahrenheit right now. These have been on here for about two hours. Ooh, and down. That's it. No, like, yes. They're dark. There you They're go. They're tender. They're ready. Okay. Back we go. Back there. Sorry, I got an accent there for a second. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's a Texas accent or... It sounded more British. British, Texas. Texas. One more time. Chicken nugget. Mm. All right. We cut these ribs up. We will set them aside. Okay. And. We're gonna take a bite. Oh. Oh. Okay. Two chunks of hickory, charcoal fire. Two hours at 325. I'll put those away. We're gonna wrap them up in foil. I do like to let those ribs rest for a little while. Um, Lenny, if you could pass me the foil, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, she's writing down questions. I'm gonna grab it. Okay, he's grabbing it. All right. These competition style ribs, again, it's a fairly sweet profile. Um, in, in our house, we cook these ribs for only two occasions. Number one, we're having guests over for supper. That hasn't happened in a long time. So the other time we cook these competition style ribs is if I'm practicing for an upcoming competition or testing out a new recipe, that sort of thing. All right, we have wrapped our rack. That's back on the smoker. Now we're ready to look at the ribs that are completely cooked, completely tender. So we're gonna cut those up and pretend we're turning them into actual judges here today. So 7.31. 7.31, thank you. You read my mind. I know. I'm used to it. All right, so these ribs, once they got tender on the smoker, we wrapped them up, throw them in an old towel or an old uh, you know, a small blanket, whatnot. Feel free to set them aside, let them rest. You can put them in a cooler. There's lots of options, but we do want to keep them hot. When I pull these ribs out, uh, we're going to do a couple things here. Number one, we're going to get ready to glaze these ribs, get the sauce on them. And number two, I'm going to be talking about how we evaluate tenderness for competition. Now let me touch on that a little bit here. So anybody new to Southern style barbecue, uh, a lot of people tend to tend to appreciate ribs that are extremely tender, literally falling off the bone. And I'm not going to put on my judgmental suit here today, but we have come to appreciate ribs that are a little tougher than that. We like ribs to be really tender, but we want there to be a little bit of texture left. Those ribs are literally falling off the bone. They are mushy. And if that's your bag, I've got no problem with that. But I would ask you to consider how awesome ribs could be with a little bit of texture left in them, right? We don't want to gum these ribs to death. We like that little bit of texture. So when I'm pulling these ribs off a smoker, um, can you run and grab me a solo cup, please? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm pulling these ribs off the smoker, I'm evaluating tenderness while they're, before I completely commit to putting these ribs away. 
And I know one of these wraps is a little bit tight tonight. Ah! Show you what that looks like. A trophy fell on my head. And one should be pretty tender. Dad. Watch out for falling trophies. No, I can't. I... Do you need help? Yeah, please. Oh my no, God. No, wait. Okay, I really did. Okay, trophy fell from the sky, but it looks like she's resolved it. Good job, honey. It's the trophy that's taller than me. The trophy? Trophy. Okay, the reason I asked for a solo cup is because I want to preserve this juice that's left in the foil, guys. It's not just brown sugar and maple syrup anymore. That juice has picked up all that flavor from the meat. Um, at home, I'll often mix that juice in with the sauce that we apply to those ribs. So much flavor, I don't want to lose it. It is delicious on ice cream. You know, throw it on some bourbon, with some ice, make a barbecue rib old fashioned out of it. Feel free to get creative, but we're not just gonna toss that out. So now back to the ribs, we're checking tenderness here. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm gonna pick up that rack right in the middle. Are you able to move the camera in, Lou? Uh, me yep. Okay. Here's the rack that's a little bit tighter. And I pick it up in the middle. I can balance this rack. <laughs> it's intact, it's not gonna break in half on me. This rib, this rack would normally go back on the smoker for a period of time, right? Now this other one, this is right on the money. I pick that up in the middle. You could use a pair of tongs if you like. You can see that grain there, that's starting to separate there. If I was a little more aggressive with this, this rack would break in half. So if that's the point I'm looking for in regards to competition tenderness. You know, there's other tricks out there. Some people will jab at it with their their probe or a toothpick, for example, right? That probe, you know, I don't even care what the number is on the dial. I'm just poking it in there between the bows. I want to feel the resistance. Whatever method you use, stick with it because you want to get good at it for competition. Okay, next step for me, we're going to get in here. We're going to give these ribs a glaze. We're going to get ready to turn into competition. So, of course, you know me, I'm using the Blue Ribbon Sweet Sauce. Full disclosure, I actually cut this sauce with a little bit of apple cider vinegar for competition. I like that little extra twang. I think that vinegar complements twang. You laughing at me? Are you from Tennessee? I'd like to be. Okay. I think that twang complements the richness of all the sweeter ingredients that were in the foil wrap. Mm. And it does thin the texture out just a wee bit too. Okay. Now, my normal competition procedure is to sauce these ribs and throw them back on the smoker for five minutes, maybe eight minutes, to allow that sauce to set up nicely. We're not doing that tonight, and I'm telling you guys why. The reason we're not doing it tonight is because I had a very interesting conversation at the Jack, the Jack Daniels World Championship Invitational Barbecue. That conversation was with a two-time winner of the Jack, talking about the finishing process on ribs and chicken. And I learned with this particular gentleman, doesn't sauce his ribs and put them back on the smoker. He sauces his ribs, cuts them up, and puts them in a box. Pretty remarkable, right? I figure if a multi-time world champion can sauce them and put them in a the box, it's worth a shot. So again, this is the rack that's a little bit tougher. This is the rack that's hit its perfect tenderness. So coming back to carving time to get this rack into the judges. I'm looking at the bones. I want to make sure my slices are parallel to the bones. Okay, being very careful. Sharp knife makes a big, big difference here, guys. You want nice, oh. clean cuts. Sorry. Right in between the bones, make sure your knife goes all the way through the meat and the bark on the other side. And usually we can get four, four to five bones right out of the middle of the rack. Okay. We're not doing the full competition presentation here today, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But for any of you amateur slash backyard cooks, 
Um, this is the demos. This is the technique we teach people in our barbecue classes, our live actual barbecue classes. And we've had people kick our asses in real competition <laughs> using this simple technique. So this program wins. Okay. Now I'm going to look at my other rack here. I know this one's a little bit tighter, but we'll still go through the motions. See these bones here curve a little more. So we're going to be a little more strategic about how we cut these up. Just trying to picture how my slices are going to come through here. I want to make sure our cuts are all parallel. Makes a nicer presentation whether you're turning into judges or just turning in food on a platter for your family. People eat with their eyes, right? It's been scientifically proven that the appearance of food affects people's perception of how it tastes. You know, the most delicious steak in the world, if it looks like crap, people are going to think it tastes, maybe not crap, but not as good as it could be. So we'll flip those over, get those ready to turn in, and why not? We're going to pretend this is a competition. We'll throw those ribs on a platter for our guests. That's nice I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Little extra bone there. I'm of course, I'm stacking. Oh, sexy! You failed. So sexy. Is that on camera? Yep. Cool. All right. So those are our competition style ribs, guys. What's that? You forgot one? No, I didn't. I'm just kidding. I don't want any. All right. <laughs> Of course I have sauce on my face. I'm a rib eater. Okay, you can back that camera up. Okay. I'll clean up here. Let me think quickly to make sure I've covered everything. We're ready to take Q&A. What time is it, Delaney? 7.40. 7.40, so we've got 20 minutes. I do have to give a quick shout out to the products that we are using tonight. Cool. Okay, what's that slippery floor? Springbok Bride Charcoal, guys. Straight out of South Africa, acacia wood. It's extremely hard, it's dense, it burns hot, it burns for a long time. And if you're a Canadian Barbecue Society member, watch for an announcement coming out soon regarding big discounts from the Barbecue Society's official charcoal sponsor. That's really cool. Secondly, uh, the wood I've started using in the last six months, Furtado Farms, Canadian hardwood, hand cut, hand harvested. We've got chunks, we've got pellets, we've got chips. It's all good, guys. Uh, the smokers I know and love, Yoder, Gateway. Um, the other smoker I've been using quite frequently lately is the Yama by Hellraiser. A little too small to do six or eight racks of ribs at a time, but definitely a cooker I've been having fun with, so. I think we're ready for questions. I gave you the sheet. Where's the sheet? Right there. Okay, where do you sell spices? Okay, uh, our website, prairiebbq.com, we do have a line of our own spice rubs and barbecue sauce that have won a number of awards. Uh, we have a couple other brands there too. Uh, we are physically located in Regina, Saskatchewan, so if you buy the products on our website, we will uh, arrange shipping or delivery or pickup. Number two, where do you buy your ribs? So these are heavyweight Canadian ribs, like I said, 44 to 46 ounce. We get these from Gordon Food Service. It is a, it is a wholesale food service rib. Um, the other source of ribs I have, if I'm looking for retail, is Costco. Costco carries American pork. Delaney, you have sauce on your face too. Wait, did I ever wipe mine off? Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Costco carries American pork. Uh, most American processors slaughter their hogs at, a, at an older age. So the ribs are naturally a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier, so. Can you use this process on beef ribs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I usually don't go with sweet on beef ribs. And if we're talking beef back ribs, same process applies. Low and slow, get a good bark on there, wrap them up in foil. Uh, beef back ribs do take longer to cook than side ribs though, so keep that in mind. Uh, if we're talking about beef uh, short ribs, whether they're from the chuck primal or the plate primal, I treat those a little bit closer to a brisket, right? Same, same technique low and slow for a long period of time, but those chuck ribs, they contain a lot of collagen. They need a long time to break down. 
foil, shiny side in or out? A very common question. I have never paid attention. I'm quite sure it doesn't make any difference. Tell us more about the BC charcoal and briquettes. Um, is that what it says, BC here? Well, I don't know. That's what the dude said. So okay. Sure. Um, the Springbrook Bry, um, the the North American distributor, does reside in BC. Uh, he is a South African born and raised, and um, I've been using this stuff for about 18 months. I started using it halfway through our Ribfest season in 2019, and uh, we use them in our Ribfest grills, and, and that kind of that kind of proved the charcoal right out of the gate. You know, we're used to running an open charcoal fire for 12 hours a day in our in our festival operations. And once we switched over to the acacia wood, the springbok lump charcoal, uh, our usage went, it got cut in half, right? This charcoal is just so hard and so dense, it burns for a really long time. That's when I became a big fan. So um, they do have briquettes on the market now. I haven't used them yet, so I can't give you my personal opinion. Looking forward to trying them out. Would you stay at 250 on an offset too? Yeah, I would. Kind of depends on your offset, right? Um, my my current philosophy is hot and fast when I have the chance. If I can produce delicious ribs in two hours, why would I want to spend six hours on them? But not every offset is does a good job at, at holding three three hundred to three fifty. So kind of depends on your pit. I can tell you that you know half of the winners that are cleaning up in the world of uh, elite competition barbecue, well, they're either cooking on drums or they're cooking on offsets, but they're cooking hot. So. Um, if you if your offset is happy at 250 and it's able, easy to keep it at that temperature for a long time, 250 is a great temperature. Does acacia charcoal add good flavor? Honestly, I've always kind of been of the opinion that charcoal doesn't add flavor. Um, charcoal in itself is pure carbon, so from a scientific perspective, it's a heat source. A lot of people uh, believe that charcoal adds flavor. Uh, most of that flavor comes from the fat that drips on charcoal, honestly. Um, the charcoal itself as a fuel source does not give off any, it doesn't give off the particles that add flavor to food. While there is visible smoke, I'm not sure that you'd be able to tell the difference in flavor from one brand to the next. So, Next question, do you change your comp flavor profile for different areas in competition? I do, but I honestly don't have enough experience to, to tell you whether it's worked or not. I use the same flavor profile across Canada, and it wins from Ottawa to Vancouver. When I go south, um, I alter my perception a little bit. You know, the American Royal Open, for example, which has a lot of untrained judges at it. I'll go a little sweeter. I'll go a little more tender. If I'm cooking in Las Vegas, where, you know, a southwest per flavor profile, maybe I'll do a little bit spicier. Um, but I honestly, I don't get enough opportunity to, to do these contests outside of Canada on a regular basis, so I don't have much to to, uh, to go from. Hot and fast. Leave membrane on to preserve moisture. No, I, I still pull it off if I'm cooking hot and fast. Um, I didn't tonight for, for my own personal use. I'm a lazy cook. Anybody knows me for a long period of time knows that. Uh, but for competition, I still pull that membrane off, for sure. Any considerations for cooking hot and fast on a pellet grill? Um, I've done it on the Yoder. Um, I've been relatively happy with the results, but not as happy as cooking hot and fast on charcoal. Um, it kind of depends on your goal. Uh, most people that are really familiar with pellet grills do understand that when pellet grills burn hotter, it's a very clean burning fire, so you don't get a lot of smoke output from them. So it kind of depends on what your goals are. If you're happy with a really light smoke profile, um, hot and fast might be the ticket. Um, my friend Brian, House of Q out in BC. Stop distracting me. My daughter is crazy. Uh, Brian with House of Q has done hot and fast uh, on his Yoder and has been quite happy with the results. I haven't tried it myself. Any considerations? No, we did that one. Uh, would the drum be indirect? Um, yeah, that's a kind of a tough question to answer. The drum has the meat cooking directly above the fire, but it's 30 inches above the fire. The term I use is semi-indirect, and that is not a very descriptive term, I understand. Um, but what makes the drum great is the meat is high enough above the fire that you don't have to worry about it burning. And you do have direct access for the fat drippings that are rendering off your meat. You hit that charcoal fire and vaporize, and those fat drip drippings give you that signature drum flavor. So, uh, not really indirect, but high enough above the fire that you don't have to worry about food burning. Do you always put the ribs in a blanket? Uh, depends on my environment. 
Uh, if I'm in an actual competition, I've got a hard shell Cambro handy and I'll just throw the ribs in a pan inside there. Uh, it's a really well insulated box. Uh, here in my cool garage, the blanket does work out really well to keep those ribs warm. COVID permitting, bare bones this year. Do you know who asked that? Yes, Jesse. Okay. Um, we're on the fence about that one. Uh, the reason being, um, without 150 person banquet to finance the event, that competition will be a significant financial hardship to me. And in most years, I'm, I'd be willing to finance that, but <laughs> it's been kind of a rough year without our festival. So um, I'm on the fence on that. It may happen, it may not. If I can figure out how to run that contest with very little prize money, uh, maybe we'll do it, but um, still too early to tell. I have the venue booked, if that means anything. Hellraiser, good for two to, what does that say? Two to four racks. Two to four racks. Oh yeah, the Hellraiser grill, the Yama grill. Um, yeah, with uh, with an extra set of grates, you can easily cook four racks at a time on there. Uh, the stock Yama grill right out of the package will cook two racks of ribs without problem. You do need the um, the baffle plate in there. That's a plate that goes above the charcoal in between the fire and the food. That baffle allows you to cook with indirect heat on the Yama. Where do you get your disposable boards? Uh, I know of two good sources in Canada. One is in Red Deer, Alberta. It's hbcdirect.ca. That's Red Deer Home Building Center. And I do believe Dixon Barbecue out of Toronto carries them as well. Um, typically, I stock up when I'm in the States. Uh, I'm running kind of low right now. I'm down to about a box, but those disposable boards are fantastic, especially when you don't want to do your own dishes after a night of doing a free live clinic on Instagram. <laughs> So perfect for me. When do you use saved juice? Um, like I said, I, I, I do like to mix it in with the barbecue sauce I apply to ribs. I stopped doing that in competition because I found I was getting a lot of variance in flavor in the end, right? It, you're often not controlling exactly how much sugar and vinegar and spice go into that foil wrap. So um, consistent competition re barbecue requires that you eliminate variables. So I wanna make sure uh, my flavor profile is the same from practice cook to actual competition cook. Um, but we'll save that, you know, if you throw it in a stew or, uh, like I said, you could, <laughs> I have used it to top ice cream before. Um, there are lots of good uses for it. It is, it is on the sweet side, so you're not going to use it for any food application out there. Do you always brush on your sauce? I always do. Um, I use a silicone brush. I think Delaney's taking it away by now, but a silicone brush. Um, and I want to make sure my sauce is thin enough that I'm not leaving any brush strokes. So I do always brush on my sauce. <sighs> what else? How does hot and fast break the collagen down like low and slow does? Um, scientifically, I'm not sure. You know, it's just a matter of getting meat from the raw state to the tender state. You know, when I first started researching barbecue, my my mentor was the internet and the common approach back then was like 200 degrees Fahrenheit. You do something like a brisket for 18 hours or a pork shoulder for 22, 24 hours. And, and uh, I was several years into it before I started reading about people cooking at 250 and getting the same results in a fraction of the time. Like, well, this is an obvious choice. Um, hot and fast is just a further extension of that. Uh, if anybody's Looking at internal temperature, um, one important factor does differentiate low and slow from hot and fast. When I'm cooking hot and fast, if you're using a temperature probe to determine when your food is done, that'll turn into that internal temperature is always going to be higher cooking hot and fast. My four hour briskets usually don't fully break down and get tender until I reach an internal temperature of 206 to 213, definitely on the higher end, but those connective tissues do definitely break down. You're done. That is all the questions I have. How are we doing for time? Seven Cool. Thanks for tuning in, guys. How many people did we have? Uh, at most, 115. At awesome. One time, at one awesome, time. awesome, awesome. If anybody has any questions, guys, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, of course. We're live here right now. Uh, we're easy to track down on Facebook and so on. Uh, we do have barbecue classes, barbecue schools open across Western Canada. Not just me, but other qualified instructors as well. So feel free to check that out. And if you're in Regina, we hope to see you at the food truck or on one of our Friday night takeout nights soon. Thanks for tuning in. I want to end it. I am hungry. Who wants ribs?
They all do. They all do. Well, that's 